morning. It's a two-point message. Uh, that's a glass half full kind of guy. Uh, I am in, in God. I am secure and I am significant. Those are the two uh, points this morning. So you can look at it as a two-point message uh, or you can look at it as a pessimist and uh, in totality those two points have 21 points. Uh, so you can look at it as a, as a two-point message or as a 21-point message. Uh, in reality, it's a if you add the two together, it's a 23-point message, so uh, you're going to need your Bible handy uh, because we have uh, scripture for each of them, and I don't expect you to look at all of them, but if you can look at as many as possible, I think it'll be a help. Last week, we looked at this thought. Uh, in Christ, I am accepted. God accepts me. And this, this morning, we're going to finish up this thought, uh, in God, um, I'm secure in God, and I am significant to God. And I think if we really uh, fully understand and grasp that concept that God accepts me, uh, I am secure in him, and I am significant to him, it really will give us a solid foundation for our lives uh, in all aspects, whatever aspect. If you know that God accepts you, you are significant to him, and you are secure in him. Um, when it boils down to it, you're going to be all right. Last week we said... Uh, it's so important that we know who we are. We talk about identity theft and how Satan, the master identity thief, is trying to not steal our identity, but he's trying to make us forget who we are. Another great example of that would be this. The, one of the very first things that we teach our children uh, when they start growing up is who they are, right? We teach them their name and how to say their name. And then as they get a little bit older and they're able to say it, how to spell their name, how to, how to form the letters, and then after that, we teach them their parents' name, uh, dad, dad, mom, or however, you know, whatever kind of form that they uh, come up with at the beginning. And then we, as they get a little bit older, maybe by the time they go to kindergarten, we want them to know maybe their address or a phone number, just a little bit of personal information. Why? Because we want them to know who they are, we want them to know where they belong, and we want them to know to whom they belong. And... Uh, my parents taught me that at a young age. I think they even made up a little song or whatever. And uh, I tried to forget what it was. I can't remember what it was. She could probably sing it for you now. But as a child of God, it's important that we know those exact same things. It's important that we know who we are. It's important to know where we belong. And it's important to know to whom, capital W, we belong. When we understand those things, uh, a lot of everything else, all the peripherals, all the troubles, all the difficulties and trials, it kind of pale in comparison to who I am, where I belong, and to whom I belong. So last week we said I'm accepted. We said I am God's child. I am Christ's friend. I am justified. I am united and one with the Lord and Spirit. I belong to God. I'm a member of Christ's body. I'm a saint. I have been adopted as God's child. I have direct access to God. I am redeemed and forgiven, and I am complete in Christ. So this morning, we're going to look at this next thought, I am secure. You say, well, I'm saved, but I just don't know if I can keep my salvation. That's, there's no, really no truth to that. There's no one who's so good that they need not be saved. And there's no one so bad that they can't be saved. And we have to understand that we are secure in Christ. Uh, number one, we'll get right into it. I am free from condemnation. You're in Romans chapter 8, I believe. The word condemnation means an adverse sentence, uh, the, the verdict. No condemnation. And, and all of these points this morning, I'll just preface this and I'll say it once. All these points are for you if you're saved, if you're trusting in Christ. None of this applies if you're not saved. Now, that's very simple. You can flip that on its head very quickly by simply trusting in Christ, believing uh, the fact that you're a sinner, that you don't deserve uh, heaven because of your sin, but God and his love gave us a way to be redeemed back to him by his son. God uh, sent his son into the world to give us an opportunity to come to him. And all we have to do is believe the fact that God sent his son to die, be buried, rise up again, shed his blood for us. And if you believe that and you trust in that and that alone for heaven, for salvation, then uh, now all these things uh, belong to you and are a part of who you are. So let's look at it. First of all, I am free from condemnation. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation 
to them which are in Christ Jesus. Pretty straightforward. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. If this morning, as a believer, you're struggling with the, with the sins that you have done after you're saved, you're saying, boy, I don't know if God could love me. Boy, I don't know if God could save me after the things that I've done. That is not Jesus. That is not God putting those thoughts into your mind. Who puts those thoughts into your mind? Satan does. Why? Because he is the accuser of the brethren. The Holy Spirit convicts you. Satan brings your sins into your face and tries to rub them in your face. Why? So that you feel like you're inadequate, that you're not saved. He's the... He is the uh, accuser of the brethren. The Holy Spirit brings your sins to mind, not to condemn, but to convict you, to bring you back into fellowship with him and say, Lord, I messed up again, it's me, uh, but would you forgive me for that? And the Bible says that he doesn't remember our sins. They're cast in the sea of his forgetfulness. So if you have thoughts of inadequacy or that God can't love you because of your sins, that's not... God putting those thoughts there. It's either you and your sinful flesh putting them there or Satan himself putting them there as accuser of the brethren. Skip down to Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. I wrote this. The only one with the credentials to condemn me is the one who this morning is interceding for me. The only man, Jesus Christ, who can say, that man there, he's a sinner. That man, he, he needs to be condemned to death and hell. The only one that has the power to do that is the one who's saying, God, would you for, don't, don't look at that. Look at me. Look at the sacrifice that I made for Drew. I know he's not perfect by any stretch, but just look at my blood. Look at what I did for him. Would you forgive him for me? And that is what Jesus is doing. We can be, oh, I have to go back to, I got rid of something. That's number one. And the other ones are going to be quicker. They're going to have to be. Number two, I am assured that all things work together for good. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Now, our view of good and God's view of good may be very different. There's a little, I saw this picture. Uh, uh, it was a, it was a, a two-picture cartoon. There was a little, little plant and there was a, a, a storm. And the, the, little, the little seedling was saying, I don't want this. And then the next picture was the sun coming out and that plant was a lot bigger and a lot stronger. The sun was out and it said, ah, that was exactly what I needed. And how often is that us? We're in a storm and we say, God, I don't want this. I don't understand this. I don't like this. Take it away from me. But then when we're stronger in our faith and things work together for our good, and we look back and we say, oh, wow, I see what God was doing there. That's exactly what I needed. All things work together for good, and it may not be exactly the way that we think it should go. That's why God's God and we're us, right? But we have to trust him that he knows what he's doing. I am secure. Number uh, three, I cannot be separated from the love of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 35, we'll continue reading down. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. There's a lot of bad things happening. And in the way of a believer, and as a Christian, you can say, you can have a, a sky is fall, falling mentality. Look at just this uh, week, right? Uh, oh, Israel's being attacked again. Uh, what's going to happen? I'm not saying don't look at the things that are going on around us and, and don't be ignorant to uh, the news and what's happening in our country and our world, but all those things, they still can't separate us from Christ's love. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, 
nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why are we not able to be separated from, from God's love? Uh, because it's not anything that we're doing. Again, it's in Christ Jesus. And all these verses on security and all these verses on significance, it has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with him and his son because we are, we are not secure in and of ourselves. We're secure because of Christ and who he is. And we are significant because of Christ and who he is. And I'm accepted because Christ is in me and he's magnified in who he is. Number four, I have been established and anointed and sealed by God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ, and hath anointed us, is God, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest the Spirit in our hearts. Boy, there's a, a sermon in and of itself just in that verse there. It won't take time, but I just want to encourage you that, you say, well, how can I know that God cares about me? How can I know that he loves me? How can I know that he's going to go good on his promises for salvation and everything else? Because he's the one that established us. He is the one that sealed us, and he's the one that anointed us. Number five, I am hidden with Christ in God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 3, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. What better place to be than with Christ? In God. That's literally, what's the best place you could be? Where you are right now. If you're saved, you are in Christ with God. Number six, I am a good work that will be perfected. Let's turn over here. I've skipped over a few uh, passages, but let's flip to Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. This verse blessed me. It's a pretty common uh, verse to, to many of us. But... carries great truth nonetheless. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Think about this. God has chosen to do a work in you. God can do a work without us. He can do a work with other things, he said, if we refuse to give praise to him, that he'll make a rock cry out. God used a donkey when his uh, man wouldn't speak. Uh, he used all different things. He used uh, Moses' rod. Uh, he used all kinds of different things. He doesn't need us. But yet he chose you to do a work in you. And then get this, not only did he choose you to do a work, he's the one who started the work. He's the one who's working. He's the one who's going to continue to do the work. Until Jesus comes back, it's all about him. It's not about us. He wants to do the work in you. Think about this. If your boss pulls you aside tomorrow morning or whenever it is that you go back to work and he tells you or she tells you, you know, I've been, I've been kind of thinking about this for a while. You, you, you've just been doing a great job at work. Um, really proud of the work you've been doing. And I'm thinking about stepping down here in a couple of years or maybe I'm going to up for a promotion. And I want you, I'm going to start grooming you to, to be in my place. I want you to take my position. How does that feel? Uh, the, Kurt's shaking his head. He's saying that's not going to happen uh, uh, next week. And, and he's right. Um, so, <laughs> so he, uh, he says, I'm going to start grooming you to be uh, my replacement starting today. I'm going to just teach you some of the little uh, nuances that maybe no one else knows. How does that make you feel from a job standpoint? That makes you feel like you've done a great job. That makes you feel like you're noticed, like you are important. Uh, how does it make you feel for your job security? If there's going to be, if you hear the next day, oh, there's going to be some job cuts. You're definitely not assuming that your job's on the line because the boss just said, you're important, you're significant, I'm going to start grooming you to take my place. That's how every single one of us is with God. He says, he which has begun a good work in you, perform it into the day of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm going to work in you, and I'm going to keep working in you until you either keel over or Christ comes back. That's an awesome promise. And if that's the only thing you take away from today, think about that, that God wants to work in you, that he is working in you. Um, are you allowing him to work in you? Number seven, I am a citizen of heaven. 
Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. I think we're in Philippians, right? You should be able to, I think most of these are in kind of uh, order, uh, going from um, Romans back, so that should help you a little bit. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. For our conversation, that word conversation in the Greek means citizenship, is in heaven. I am a citizen of heaven. From whence also we look for the, for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I wrote this down. I am a U.S. citizen. As, our, as I believe all of us this morning. When I go to Canada on a fishing trip or if I were to go to a different place on a, a missions trip, I'm still a U.S. citizen. My location does not change my citizenship. We are all citizens of heaven. Once you uh, trusted Christ as Savior, you were no longer a citizen of, of the world. Jesus, in his prayer for the disciples and for those that were going to be saved uh, for the rest of humanity, he said, I pray that you wouldn't take them out of the world because they're not of the world, uh, but would you protect them from the evil of the world? Jesus said, I'm not of the world. I came down. I'm a citizen of heaven. And he said, these, these men and women that are trusting in me, they're not citizens of the world either. They don't belong here per se, but that's where, they, where we are now. My location doesn't change the fact that though I'm here, that my citizenship is in heaven, take it a step further. My lifestyle doesn't change the fact that I'm a citizen of heaven. We look at some people and because we have a natural, or at least I do, I have a naturally judgmental attitude. I look at someone and say, well, there's no way they're saved, or there's no way that church is doing right because, you know, they're, you know, they don't look like us, or boy, this person, boy, he doesn't look saved. I want to encourage you with the fact that you may not be doing everything that you ought to be doing. Here's a little secret I'll just let us, let us all in on. None of us had a perfect week, all right? I've never had a perfect week. Uh, if you say that you had a perfect week, well, you started off great because now you just lied, and uh, now we know you don't. Never had a perfect week and not look, I don't think I have one in my near future. So none of us are doing everything right all the time. And, but that doesn't change the fact that I'm still a citizen of heaven, right? Now, should we be trying to do the best that we can? Absolutely. And we're not trying to do the best we can in our own strength. We're doing it in the strength that the Lord gives us. We have no ability to be sanctified in our own strength. Does it make sense that us as sinners um, and sinful flesh, when we trust Christ, it says that we ought to try to be like him? Do we have the ability to be like him in our own strength? Absolutely not. Our, the best that we have to offer is nowhere near good enough. That's why we need to be saved. So we don't have any strength to become better. The becoming better, well, we just talked about it. It's God who's working the work in us. He gives us through the power of his Holy Spirit to be sanctified. We're not sanctified in our own strength. So we ought to be becoming uh, like Christ. We ought to do the best that we can. But if you fail, it doesn't mean that you failed of salvation or you've made God disappointed somehow and somehow he doesn't love you as much as he loves me. He loves all of us the same. There's no way he can love us anymore. My location in, in earth does not change my citizenship in heaven. My lifestyle does not change my citizenship in heaven. That doesn't mean we have a free uh, sin as much as uh, you want to card either. The, the Bible talks a lot about that. We're going to dig deep there uh, this morning. I'm a citizen of heaven. Number eight, I have not been given a spirit of fear. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, a verse that many of us could quote together. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of what? Power and of love and of a sound mind. So that means that if God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, who has? Satan or me in my own faithlessness. Fear is simply faith turned inside out. And faith is fear. Turned, they're, they're opposites. Fear is the opposite of faith. Faith is the opposite of fear. So if you're fearful this morning, you strengthen our faith. You can be fearful about many things. You can be fearful about your salvation. You can be fearful about, oh, well, my children, my grandchildren. Fearful about your job, fearful about finances, whatever you're fearful about, we need to strengthen faith in that area. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power. And God's given us the power. I can do, we're going to talk about it in a minute. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Of love, well, I don't have the ability to love all of you the way that I ought to this morning in my own strength, but he's given me the ability to. And of a sound mind. Again, if we think 
If we follow our heart, if we do what we want to do this morning, we're going to wind up in a world of hurt. But when we transform by the renewing of our mind, now we're not thinking with our mind, we're thinking with the mind of Christ. Number nine, I can find grace and mercy in time of need. We're talking about being secure. What better security blanket than to know that when I get in a tough spot, and really always, even when I'm not in a quote-unquote tough spot, I can find grace and mercy from the Lord. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Number 10, I am born of God, and the evil one cannot touch me. 1 John 5, verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. He that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that the wicked one toucheth him not. You cannot be, if, you're, if you are saved and trusting in Christ and your, His Holy Spirit is in you, you cannot be possessed by the devil. You can be oppressed, uh, but you cannot be possessed of the devil. S wicked one can't touch you. Think about Satan when he wanted to pr try to prove to God that Job would turn coat and curse God to his face. Before Satan did anything to God, what did he first have to do? He went and asked permission, right? So I'm secure. Why? Because I'm free from condemnation. All things work together for good. I can't be separated from Christ's love. I'm established. I'm anointed. I'm sealed. I'm hidden with Christ and God. I'm a Good. I am a good work. I'm a citizen of heaven. I've not been given to the spirit of fear. I find grace and mercy in time of need, and I am born of God. The evil one cannot touch me. So let's look at this a last thought this morning. I'm accepted by God. I am secure in God. And lastly, I am significant to God. Number one, I am the salt and light of the earth. Turn to Matthew chapter uh, 5, verse 13. Now we're going to reset. We're going to go back uh, to the beginning of the New Testament and kind of work our way through again. We're going to spend a little bit of time on this first one, and then we're going to hasten through the rest of them. Um, if you feel like you weren't able to write all these down, the points and references. I'm happy to share notes uh, if you want to look at them in the last, in the last um, two Sunday morning services I've shared 33 points and about I think like 50 verses. So that's a lot to try to write down if you're a note taker or like to kind of meditate on them throughout the week. Happy to share my notes with you. Uh, nothing secret in here. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. I am the salt and light of the earth. We're talking about the significance that we have in God. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. I am the salt of the earth. What does salt do? Salt heals. Does our, do we need healing today? Absolutely. Does our world need healing today? Absolutely. Salt preserves, preserves a word, it preserves the saints. Salt flavors, salt purifies. The problem today in America, the problem today in our world is not the government. We all just, we, the government gets blamed for a lot of things, right? Some rightfully so, and maybe some not so much. The Democrats are not the problem this morning. And if you're a Democrat, the Republicans aren't the problem this morning. It's not the illegal immigrants, it's not the LGBTQ community, it's not the, any one people group, it's not the Black Lives Matter movement. The problem is right here this morning with saltless saints. All of the things that salt does, all of the things that I am supposed to do as a believer in Christ, when I stop doing it, this is what it causes. You say, what would happen if people just stopped following the Bible, and people stopped living the way that they were supposed to. Look around. This is what happens. The problem is not the White House. The problem is right here in the church house. The Bible says here, but if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing, 
the salt that they would, they would bring out of the sea, they would, they would uh, go, let it go through a process to where it was able to be used, but if it sat too long and the rain would leach out all of the good natural saltiness out of the salt, all that would be left would actually be a toxic chemical. They would take that and they would throw it on the road. The only thing that it was good for was to be road material, base, gravel. And actually it worked out great as a road because it was so acidic, so bitter, that it would kill everything in its way. It would kill all the plants, it would kill all the weeds, and it would make great roads, and then people would walk on it. You feel like the church and believers and people that stand for right are getting walked all over in our government today and in society today? Why? Because we've lost our savor. We've stopped believing, or maybe not believing, but openly saying that the Bible is the word of God and living our lives to follow it and standing up for what's right, being an open witness for Christ. And the Bible says when salt loses its savor, all it's good for is to be walked on. Don't be surprised that we're getting walked all over today because we've lost our savor. That's all we're good for, just to get walked all over. We are also light. There is no such thing as darkness, only the absence of light. And if you don't like how dark your community is, how dark your neighborhood is, how dark our world is, let your lights shine. We sing it. Hide it under a bushel. Yeah, because then I don't have a lot of things to do and I don't have Emily obligations at church and I don't have to be a witness. Let your light out. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which art in heaven. Ye are salt and light. Now that was the... Uh, that was the stepping on toes part of the message. The rest is going to be, uh, uh, oh, I, I thought this was going to be encouraging. It is. I'm encouraging you uh, to be a salty saint and the light of the world. I am salt and I am light. Number two, I'm a branch of the true vine. I am significant. John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. Some of you wonder, why am I spinning my tires spiritually? Why can't I see anyone saved? Why can't I get off dead center? It's because some of you have cut yourself off from the true vine, the, brand, the Jesus, and you're trying to do it all on your own. I have never seen a branch uh, laying in the middle of the woods, doing great. It always just looks like it's dying and dead. And, and, uh, and, but it's funny, but in the same way, we cut ourselves off from Christ and from church and from the people of God and then wonder, why do I feel like I'm dying here? Because you are, spiritually. We are connected. we got to be connected to the, the main root. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. I am salt. I am light. I am tapped into the true vine. Number three, I have been chosen to bear fruit. Yeah, I didn't have to let you sprout as a branch, but he chose. You say, well, I, I've got God. No, you don't. God's got you. <laughs> But I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. God chose me. That makes me significant. Number four, I am a personal witness for Christ. I remember as a kid, I always wanted to have a personal pan pizza. And uh, when we, if we went out uh, to Pizza Hut, uh, it we definitely weren't in the uh, each kid gets their own personal pan pizza uh, tax bracket. Uh, so, but I, I remember I always, I always wanted uh, personal pan pizza. So I remember one time I went out with Granny to Pizza Hut and she got me a personal pan pizza. I remember I ate the whole thing and then I think I threw it up afterwards. Uh, but uh, I'm a personal witness for Christ. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Boy, I can't. I can't be a witness. I'm too nervous. Yeah, you can be a witness. You choose not to because you have the power that you need to be a witness through him. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me. I am a personal witness for Christ. What does a witness do? You say, well, I don't, I don't know how to 
give the gospel to somebody. I'm not as good with words as you are. Well, that's why I write them all down. I'm terrible with words too. Maybe if you put a little effort into it, you'd get better. Witness, a witness in a case simply shows up and recounts what they've seen. You ever had anything good happen in your life because of, of God? You ever share that with anybody outside of these four walls? That'd be a powerful, yeah, well, my testimony isn't that amazing. The fact that you were a sinner and on your way to hell and God sent a son to die for you and come up out of the grave for you and he's in heaven praying for you and you trusted him and now you get to go to heaven, that's not amazing? Share it with somebody. That's what a witness is. Number five, I am God's temple. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? God dwells in me. God is living in me this morning. If no, if no other point for significance than that, that makes me significant. God chose to live here. I am a minister of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, let's turn there. I am a minister of reconciliation. What's reconciliation? If a relationship is broken, something is apart, uh, Ethan, maybe that'd be a good... Ethan uh, had his finger cut off by a wood splitter. And they took him down to Ann Arbor and they tried to reconcile his finger uh, back to his hand. They weren't able to do it, but had they been able to, the doctor would have been a minister of reconciliation, bringing something uh, together that was once apart. We were once apart from God. But because of Christ, Christ is the stitch, so to speak, that keeps me, uh, the finger, uh, connected to the hand. Because of Christ, I have the ability to be reconciled, and now that I've been reconciled to him, he makes me a minister of reconciliation to others. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, He's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And the things and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That's why racism is not biblical whatsoever. That's why, and not just racism, having a us for and no more mentality, little cliques in church, well, it's, that is completely against God and Jesus and everything that the Bible talks about. All the middle wall of partition was broken down. There is no more Jew or Greek, bond or free, male or female. We are all one in Christ. So these little segregations and little, well, I don't know why he's here. Why well, do? Because God wants him to be here. And we're supposed to be ministers of that reconciliation saying, come on, come, come see what the Lord has done. Come be a part of us. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Ugh. We like to point out and say, well, we don't want him here because, you know, you know. You want to stand up here and have us go through all the reasons why you shouldn't be here? I don't want anyone to start that with me. Uh, no, thank you. So let's just all just get off our high horse and say, you know what, we're all not perfect. We're all Pharisees, so to say. Uh, let's just... Focus on not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ that be reconciled to God. What else? We're almost done here. I am God's co-worker. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive the grace of God. Receive not the grace of God in vain. We are working together with God. God is working in us, but we are also working together with him. That's pretty awesome. Number eight, I am seated with Christ. Ephesians chapter two, verse six, that hath raised us up together and hath made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where is Christ sitting today? So I'm, I'm sitting with Christ in a pretty good spot. Number nine, I am God's workmanship. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Number 10, I can approach God with freedom and confidence. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12, in whom 
we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. We, my grandpa and I bought this trail camera from Spy Point, and uh, it doesn't work. We paid, uh, well, he paid good money. You ever have your dad, I paid good money for that. You ever paid anything with bad money? It's all good money, right? We paid good money for it. It doesn't work. So it says, if you have any problems, call 1-800, yada, yada, yada. So we call. We can't get a hold of them. Uh, so then he tried. I can't get a hold of them. You try again. So the one day I, I, was just, I was just dead set. I am going to talk to somebody. You know, speak with a representative. Yeah, how many of you, times have you hollered that into a phone, right? <laughs> It's like, if you want this, press one. Speak with a representative. If you want this, press two. And uh, you're, you are important to us. Uh, please hold. And then, so I was on there. I set it on the desk. I was working. Hour and a half. I finally got tired of the intermission music. Do, 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 do. So I just, I'm done. Can't get a hold of them. That's not how God is. God, I need something. Uh, thank you for calling the heavenly line. Uh, God's busy right now. You're like, yeah, well, I, I need him right now. Like, uh, would you like to speak with the representative? No, uh, I would like to speak with uh, the boss. I want manager, please. Uh, that's not how God is. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by faith of him. Lastly, verse 11, I can do all things through Christ. In context, the Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, is talking about the fact that we have the ability to give thanks in all situations for all things. It's not as fun as, well, I can do, you know, I can progress in my job, I can do this, I can do that. When, it, when, it, when we're looking at thanks, you know, the bad things that come into our life, God says, give thanks for all things unto God, the Father, by Him. But in a general sense, we have the ability to do all things. Whatever He asks of you, whatever He asks of me, we can't do it. Why? because we have access to unlimited power. And if God asks us to do something, he'll give us the wisdom and guidance to do it, he'll give us the direction, he'll give us the means, he'll give us the finances. You can step out and faith. When God says, hey, will you do this? And in our, in our logical mind, we say, well, that doesn't work out. You know, we're like, a, we're like a Philip. 200 penny with a bread can't you know, feed all these people. We got it all figured out in our mind. God says, will you just do it? Don't you think the, the guy who, who has access to power and all wisdom and all finances and all everything, think if he asks you to do it, that he'll be able to give you the strength and the ability to come through? So when God asks you to do something in faith, it's, re it's really not, it doesn't require that much faith to do it because you know if it's his will that he's going to provide. And if it's not his will, it's going to fall flat and wasn't supposed to happen anyways. We can be confident in that, but we can do all things through Christ. I hope this has been an encouragement to you. I'm accepted by God. I am secure in God, and I am significant to God.